Okay, so um, so now to our presentation. Um, I don't know if Bruce has switched already. Um, Chris Cosma, Cosma, um, and um, Margaret met him as we said in uh, when, before this uh, over at a meeting or a get together at a um, conservation spot in Palm Desert. And so she was very impressed when she heard him speak also at um, the California Native Plant Society too. So um, as you can see, he's a PhD candidate and um, he, I was excited because I knew that he was gonna talk some, a little bit about moths at least and um, native plants. So um, yeah, take it away and oh, questions afterwards if please. And we'll, um, you can put them in the chat or just wait till we you know, ask for questions. Okay, Chris, it's your turn. All righty. Well, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. Thank you so much for the introduction. And yeah, it's really great to be here. It's great to see some familiar faces. I see Karen, who I also saw at the CMPS conference, and of course, Margaret. So again, thank you for the invite. And yeah, let's let's talk about moths and native plants and other stuff. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. All right, so yeah, this, this talk is titled Prioritizing California Native Plants for Butterfly and Moth Conservation. And by the way, if you can't hear me throughout this talk, um, just let me know. Hopefully everything's working here. Um, so yeah, I'm a PhD candidate um, in Dr. Nicole Rafferty's lab in the Evolution, Ecology, and Organismal Biology Department at UC Riverside. And here's... If you're interested in learning more about our lab in general, um, our website is here, rafferty.lab.ucr.edu. And this is our lab group, um, RPI Nicole Rafferty. Here in the middle, we have um, three graduate students now. One of our graduate students just, uh, just obtained her degree. And um, we also have two postdocs currently in the lab. Um, we, we just had another postdoc and a new graduate student join the lab, so the lab is growing as well. And um, generally in the Rafferty lab, we study the effects of climate change on mutualisms. And mutualisms are just the ecological interactions in which both species involved in that interaction benefit in some way. And the really classic example of mutualism and the one that we study the most are plant pollinator interactions. So the way that insects and other organisms help plants reproduce. Um, and also in the lab, we study other forms of mutualisms like below ground mutualisms. Um, and some of you may be familiar with my, uh, mycorrhizal fungi, which help plants take up nutrients. Um, and we also study things like rhizobial bacteria. So most of my research focuses on moth pollination, particularly in Southern California involving native plant species. So I'm gonna be talking a lot about that today. Um, and generally throughout this talk, I want to paint moths not as these pests that we're all familiar with that eat our clothes and um, eat the grains in our pantry or fly around our faces at nighttime. Although, you know, a lot of popular culture have painted uh, moths in this negative light, um, what I want to do today is convince you that moths are um, instead really important components in our, of our ecosystems. Um, number one as important pollinators, so I'll be talking a lot about moth pollination today, um, but also as really critical components of our terrestrial food webs as food sources for a variety of organisms, including birds and bats. All right, so although I do study moths mainly, I, I wanted to begin today's talk with a species that I suspect everyone here is probably familiar with, and that is the monarch butterfly. So you may know that just about three or four months ago, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature officially um, declared the migratory monarch butterfly an endangered species and put it in their red list. And so the reason behind this listing is a long history of decline for the migratory, the migratory monarch butterfly. 
Um, and so the, the Western monarch Thanksgiving count um, tallies the population of monarchs that overwinter here in California. And in 2020, this census counted fewer than 2,000 individual monarchs. So you can't even see the bar here. The green bars here um, are the population size through the years on the x-axis. Um, so this, this plummet in 2020 actually represented an over 99% decline in this population since around the 1980s. And so the monarch is declining. Um, and, you know, I, like many of you here, I've been learning about the monarch since I was a kid. It's a really famous example of a charismatic species and has been the topic of a lot of conservation efforts. Um, but the, the truth is that the monarch butterfly, um, although endangered, is a poster child for a much larger problem. And so here in the US, studies have shown that around half of all butterfly species in the country are declining. Um, so that's over 200 butterfly species. And declines are especially apparent here in parts of California and generally in the Southwest and other parts of the West. And so this is a heat map from one of these studies um, where the warmer colors, so particularly the red colors, are showing the areas with the highest rates of butterfly decline. And you can see here that in the Southwest, um, butterflies are declining by almost 2% per year. And in fact, studies here in California and other parts of the West have shown that butterfly abundance, so just the number of butterflies flying around out there, is declining by a, almost 2%, 1.6% per year in the Western US. Um, and this is uh, over the past four decades. And really importantly, these studies, um, including by Matt Forrester at UNR, have shown that dozens of Western US butterfly species are even more at risk than the monarch butterfly. And this includes very widespread species. This is um, the West Coast lady, Vanessa Annabella, pictured here. Very common butterfly, very widespread. But this research indicates that this species is even more at risk of extinction than the monarch butterfly. All right, so taking a step back, looking at the broader picture here, there are around 240 butterfly species in California, and we know that their populations are declining on average. But like I said, I study moths primarily, and so I'm going to be talking a lot about moths in this talk. So what about the around 5,000 moth species that we have just in California alone? Well, the fact is we don't really know how moth populations are doing because unlike butterflies, no one really takes the time to study uh, long-term population trends for moths. But we do have comprehensive data sets from other parts of the world, including in Britain, where they found that moths are declining, uh, or they found that a 33% decline in moth abundance since 1968. So just over the past 50 years or so, 33% um, decline in moth populations. So here we see that downward trend. All right, so butterflies, moths are declining. Why does that matter? Well, one of the reasons we care about declines in Lepidoptera, which is the order, the insect order that includes butterflies and moths, is that it's the second most diverse group of insects. Um, so just here in North America alone, there are over 14,000 species of butterflies and moths. And um, something that's often met with surprise is that the vast majority of these species in the order Lepidoptera are moths and not butterflies. So 95% of the species diversity in Lepidoptera are moths. And so here's a, a phylogenetic tree, which is just showing the evolutionary relatedness between these species in the order Lepidoptera. And just this very small highlighted section here are our small subset of butterflies. Everything else in the order are moths. All right, so they're super diverse. Um, another thing we know about butterflies and moths is that they're really important components of our ecosystems. So as caterpillars, butterflies and moths in their larval stage, um, they're herbivores. So they're taking in that plant energy. And as caterpillars and also as adults, 
Butterflies and moths are really important food sources for birds and bats and other organisms. And it turns out in these two roles as herbivores and then as prey, Lepidoptera transfer more energy from plants to other animals than all other herbivores combined. So they're the single most important group of insect herbivores or any or herbivores that we have. And so I really wanna stress this point here that herbivory is a really good thing. So herbivory is often cast in this negative light um, as you know, something that destroys our plants. And you know, for people that are into gardening, which I suspect many of you are, you know, herbivory is a nuisance. Um, but when you see signs of herbivory, um, you should, you know, you should be delighting in the fact that you are actually taking part in supporting a food web in your local ecosystem. And so again, as caterpillars. Um, and uh, in their larval stage, they're eaten, Lepidopter are eaten by birds, taking in that plant energy again that um, as herbivores and then being eaten by the birds and the higher level predators like hawks and, and other predators. And so transferring that plant energy that they take in up the food web. And then similarly, as um, adults, butterflies and moths are also eaten by things like bats and again, transferring that plant energy up the food web. So I'm going to be circling back to this idea of herbivory being a really good thing and um, again, being a sign of a healthy food web. And again, Butterflies and moths are the single most important groups of herbivores that we have. And some work by Doug Tallamy that I know some of you are familiar with, um, he's found that caterpillars uh, can make up to 90% of the diet of some of our native songbirds. And caterpillars are especially important for baby birds. So rearing uh, baby birds, a lot of their diet comes from caterpillars. And then some bats, so some bat species here in the Western US are moth specialists. And that means basically they almost exclusively eat moths. And so it's really no, uh, no surprise that Lepidoptera declines have been linked to declines in native songbirds and bats. So again, some work by Doug Talamy has shown that insectivorous birds, so birds that mainly rely on insects for their diet have declined by 2.9 billion individuals over the last 50 years. Um, so, you know, this is in the news a lot. Um, our native birds are not doing well. And uh, here I'm showing you that uh, there's evidence suggesting that it's directly linked to the decline of insects. So in contrast to those, ins those insect eating birds, non-insectivorous birds, so birds that mainly rely on seeds or alternative food sources in their diet have actually increased by 26.2 million individuals. Um, so this is really compelling evidence, again, that the decline that we're seeing in a lot of our native bird species are directly linked to these declines in Lepidoptera. All right, so there are important components of our terrestrial food webs. They're super diverse, but we also know that butterflies and moths are important pollinators. And a lot of the credit here is given to butterflies. We all know that butterflies are out there visiting our flowers, transferring our pollen, helping to pollinate these plants. But there's increasing evidence suggesting that moths are actually probably even more important pollinators than butterflies. Um, and this includes um, pollination services provided to both wild and agricultural plants. So I'm going to go through some of the, those examples here. Um, well, this was so here in California and other parts of the West, we know that moths help pollinate uh, avocados, berries like raspberries and blackberries, apples, and even perhaps oranges. So I'm going to show you here a video from my own backyard showing a moth that I caught visiting my orange tree that I have growing here. So I haven't actually seen a paper describing moth pollination of oranges, but I think this is um, pretty good evidence here that moths, just like bees, are out there at night visiting our agricultural plants, providing those pollination services that we in part rely on for our food production. And then of course, we have many famous examples of moth pollinated native plants in California. That includes yucca, 
Um, the yucca yucca moth interaction is a really famous example of coevolution. And then we have hawk moth pollination of species like um, uh, species in the genus Datura, evening primrose, and agave species. All right, so what I'm not going to talk about today is another part of my research, which I'll introduce very briefly, is that um, I go out into the field and I collect moths with these homemade light traps that I've designed. Um, and then I identify these moths to see what kind of diversity we have out there. Here are some of our native moth species. And some of these moths are really, really cool looking. I really don't think moths get enough credit for their beauty. You know, we all know that butterflies are very beautiful, but these are some of our native moth species that are flying around out there. Uh, we, we may not be awake to see them, but I think they are incredibly beautiful. And then in the second part of this research, I take the uh, pollen loads that those moths are carrying on their sucking mouth part mouth parts, their proboscides. Um, so here's a picture of a moth proboscis all coiled up. That's how they keep them at rest. And what you see here on this uh, on this proboscis are the pollen grains. So these are the pollen of um, native agricultural plant species that these moths are visiting. And some of these moths are carrying a tremendous amount of pollen on their proboscis. Some of them get pretty clogged up, as you can see. And it turns out in this research so far, I found that over 50% of all moths across California ecosystems, in Southern California at least, are transporting pollen. And so this isn't just, you know, our hawk moths. A lot of you know, like the white line sphinx, Hylis lineata, a very common moth pollinator that often visits plants um, at dawn and at dusk. Um, it's not just these large charismatic moths, it's these boring little gray brown moths that we hardly pay attention to um, that, you know, fly around our lights. Um, these moths are visiting our plants and helping to pollinate these plants. So this is, again, one of these moths, uh, just a very nondescript moth here. And this is the pollen load that he's carrying on his, on his proboscis. All right, so clearly Lepidopter are really important components of our ecosystem. And so we wanna you know, protect these services that they provide to other species, to ecosystems, and also to humans. Um, and doing that requires an understanding of why Lepidopter have been so impacted by global change. And it turns out that that's a pretty hard question to answer here. Um, in 2021, David Wagner, a famous entomologist, described the global threats to insects as death by a thousand cuts. And this is really the idea that there are just so many threats being thrown at insects from all sides that it's often really hard to determine the main or single cause behind any decline in a species. And it's often a combination of many interacting factors. And those include things like habitat loss and introduced species and pollution, including light pollution, um, which is really bad for nocturnal organisms like moths. We have pesticides, and of course we have the myriad effects of climate change. Um, anything from drought to heat waves to forest fires. And I wanna focus in on climate change here because this heat map that I showed you earlier that was showing that the highest rates of butterfly decline in the US are here in the Southwest, including large parts of California. Um, it turns out that um, those declines correlate very closely with recent climate change in this area. So the bottom panels here um, from this paper showing that the uh, the species abundance trend. So here in the negative numbers, we have declining butterfly abundance um, is correlated with lower precipitation here on the x axis in panel B and higher temperature here in uh, panel C. So again, lower precipitation, higher temperature, that's exactly what we're seeing, especially here in the Southwest United States. And this is really bad for our butterfly populations. So to kind of conclude this part here, just like you know, all of these 
global change stressors, these anthropogenic stressors, climate change, habitat loss, are leading to declines in insects worldwide. They are affecting butterfly and moth populations, including right here in California. Um, but another thing that we know about butterflies and moths, um, thanks especially to the a charismatic monarch butterfly here is that butterflies and moths rely very closely on native plant species. And so the monarch butterfly is what we call a host plant specialist. And that means that its caterpillars can pretty much only develop on uh, milkweed species. In fact, only species in the genus Asclepius. Um, and we know that specialist species are potentially at greater risk of extinction under environmental change because they are more easily decoupled from their resources. So I'm going to go through a quick example of that here. And so let's say on the other side of the spectrum of specialization, we have what we call an ecological generalist. And a generalist is a species that can rely on many different resources. So in the case of host plants for caterpillars, this could be a caterpillar that relies on a dozen different host plant species. And so the local loss or extinction of any one of these native plant species is not likely to heavily affect this ecological generalist because it can rely on any one of these alternative partners, these alternative plant species. But in the case of our ecological specialists like the monarch butterfly, that same local loss of its only host plant will have a large negative impact on that species, again, because it's the only plant species it can rely on in its ecosystem. And the monarch butterfly is not alone in this host plant specialization. So 90% of plant eating insects, um, not just butterflies and moths, but across the board, 90% um, are host plant specialists. Um, and what this usually means is that they specialize on native plant species. And this is because of coevolution. So through millions of years of living alongside one another, native plants and native insects have developed very fine tuned relationships to the point that often it's the only plant species these native insects can rely on. And so that's why it's so important to plant native plants. So we've been talking a lot about host plants for caterpillars, um, but one thing that I want to emphasize here as well is that Lepidoptera rely on native plant resources at each stage of their life cycle. And so we have um, the Lepidoptera life cycle that I'm going to go through here. Um, eggs are deposited on native host plants. Um, and so I'm showing pictures of the monarch butterfly, but remember this is true of most butterfly and moth species. Give me one second here. I just want to make sure. Yep. Sorry. My computer did something weird right there. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know what happened. I lost I lost the screen all of a sudden. Can you see? Can everyone see my screen again? Yes. All yeah, right. we can see it. All right, thank you. All right, so the Lepidoptera life cycle, we have the eggs deposited on native host plants. Um, again, caterpillars are often highly specialized on those native host plants. We have even things like chrysalis and cocoon placement. Um, re, uh, benefit from diverse native plant resources. And then, of course, as adults, butterflies and moths visit flowers for nectar and thereby help pollinate those plants. And there's been studies indicating that native plants are often more attractive to them um, and uh, provide greater nutritional benefit to these native species as well. All right, so just looking at this, um, this uh, Lepidoptera life cycle, it becomes very clear that Lepidoptera need native host plants and nectar plants. Um, and so again, those host plants are the plants that are eaten by our larval Lepidoptera, the caterpillars, and the, the nectar plants are those plants that are visited and often pollinated by adult Lepidoptera. 
And so in light of this, it's no surprise that lepidopter declines, um, including right here in California, have been shown to be driven by the loss of native host and nectar plants due to things like habitat destruction and climate change and all of those other factors that I talked about. All right, so a lot of the beginning of this talk is pretty bad news. You know, we're talking about some pretty, you know, distressing things here, the collapse of insect populations. It's not something that I like to talk about per se, but I, I do want to focus the rest of this talk on um, the good news, which is what we can do about it. Um, and really, you know, not just what I've been doing about it, but what everyone um, anyone living in California or the rest of this country can help uh, do about lepidopter decline. And we know that part of the equation here is planting native plants. And so because of those shared co-evolutionary histories, native plants support up to 15 times more native lepidopter species than introduced in ornamental plants. And um, the monarch butterfly has taught um, a lot of generations this really important lesson that native insects need native plant species, but it's not just the monarch butterfly. Um, so another really important part of this um, in the context of climate change is that we know that increasing the extent and connectivity of diverse native habitat is really critical. And that's why we see a lot of emphasis on things like habitat corridors, um, you know, bridges over highways connecting one side of the road to the other with habitat. Um, that connectivity is critical for conservation. And part of that means today when a lot of our landscapes look something like this, you know, uh, houses stacked up on top of one another and in, in these uh, developments, part of this means using any amount of land that we have available to us to help increase this connectivity. And so there have been studies showing that milkweed gardens, um, in the case of the monarch butterfly, uh, on private land, so people's yards and gardens uh, can contribute to effective monarch conservation. And so really any yard or garden or even a pot on a balcony or patio can be an important insect waste station, an important uh, resource for our native insects. And so here's, uh, this is just a pot of native milkweed that I grew this, this past season. Uh, in a in a pot on my patio and it attracted monarchs and some of their caterpillars did develop on them. I didn't see them pupate. I hope they they made it that far. But again, um, you know, any yard or garden can help in this task. So I, I know I probably in this audience don't need to expound on why we need to plant native plants and why that's important, but I do think that we all can improve the way we plant native for insect conservation. I'm going to go through what I mean um, here. All right, so the monarch butterfly is at risk, and that's why we plant milkweed. But, you know, it's not just the monarch that's at risk especially today. And as the list of species of butterflies and moths that are threatened grows larger and larger, the list of native plants that we need to support them also grows. And so really effective lepidopter conservation means moving from this perspective focused on individual species and interactions, and instead considering entire communities of butterflies and moths and the native plants that they require. And one of the ways that we can do this is by using ecological networks. And ecological networks are just a, a framework, a one that I use in my research. Um, and it it's a way to describe the interactions between entire communities of plant species and the insects that rely on them for resources. And so, for example, we have a entire community of native plant species and the native butterfly and moth caterpillars that use them as host plants. Um, and analyzing these sorts of networks can help in uh, prioritizing species for conservation. And so we can identify species that may be uh, especially at risk, so especially vulnerable species like the monarch butterfly, which is an extreme specialist. Um, but we can also identify species that are perhaps disproportionately important, um, and this could include 
plant species that support many insect species in the community. So these generalist plants that um, provide resources for maybe not one or two, but hundreds of butterfly and moth species. And so in order to advance butterfly and moth conservation here in California, I've developed a tool called the Butterfly Net. And this is a web application. You can access it at the link here. I'm gonna go ahead and also put that in the chat real quick here so everyone can see it. If I can find the Zoom chat. All right, so I shared it in the chat. I need to reshare my screen. Oh. All right, so this uh, again is a web application. Um, you can also uh, access it on your phone like, uh, using this QR code, but it does work better on a computer or a tablet. And this tool is designed to help people in California find the best hosts and nectar plants for butterflies and moths anywhere that you live. And so I'm gonna go through how I developed this tool and why we need it for the rest of this talk. Um, all right, so the data that went into this tool is comes from a guide called California Plants as Resources for Lepidoptera um, by Jeffrey Caldwell. So Jeffrey Caldwell um, was a native plant garden gardener horticulturist who lived up in the Bay Area. He's currently retired and living, um, I think, somewhere in the South. And uh, so he spent a lot of his career uh, in his free time just compiling a bunch of data um, uh, of interactions between butterflies and moths and their native California hosts and nectar plants um, across the entire state. And so this is a super comprehensive data set and it really um, allows us an unparalleled opportunity to look at these interactions and use this data to help guide conservation efforts. And so the first part of this project, what I did with the help of many undergraduates as we digitized this data. So it was in kind of a written format. So we had to put it into these tables that we use to then uh, convert into what are called interaction matrices. And then we can um, model and analyze the sorts of interaction networks that I've been showing here. So these are really, really massive data sets and there's really no good way to display this data. Um, but what you're seeing here that kind of looks like a jumble is uh, are called circle graphs. And so what you see on the outside as a continuous line of color here are actually shapes which uh, represent each individual plant species connected by lines which represent their interactions. Um, and so between these two networks, we have we have the flower visitation network, um, which uh, describes the interactions between adult butterflies and moths and the flowers that they visit, the plant species they visit for nectar. Um, and then we have the herbivory network, which again is the uh, host plant interactions with caterpillars. Um, between these two networks, we have thousands of native plant species, thousands of lepidopter species, and thousands of individual interactions. Um, in, in fact, the number right now is at about 16,000 individual interactions recorded throughout the state of California. And so analyzing this massive amount of data, I've arrived at three really important um, priorities for more effective lepidopter conservation in California. And number one, we have to plant native hosts and nectar plants. Number two, we have to prioritize the most important plant species. And number three, we have to consider geographic variation in species and interactions. And I'm going to go through each one of these throughout the rest of the talk. Um, I'm going to circle around to point number three first, because a lot of my results for the first parts rely on this. Um, you know, California is a huge and diverse state. We all know this. And what that means is that not only do we have an extreme diversity of species, but we also have a diversity of habitat types and interactions between species. And all of these things can vary with things like latitude and elevation and distance from coast. So the monarch, again, is a great example of this. There are around 15 native milkweed species throughout the state of California, each in a slightly different region. And we know that it's really important to plant local milkweed species. 
Um, and the reason being that when you don't do that, when you plant species that don't belong there, um, you risk confusing monarch migration patterns. And so extending that idea to the community level, looking at entire communities of plants and insects, I've taken our eco regions in California, which are just areas of similar, similar climate and, um, and ecosystem types. And with anywhere that you live in one of these eco regions, there's going to be a variety of different natural habitat types that occur around you. And so, um, for example, when we were up in San Jose for the CMPS conference, some of the um, habitat types that they have up there are uh, chaparral and different types of grasslands. And so, across these habitat types, there are going to be plant species and insect species um, represented by these dots here that occur there. Some of these species are going to be confined to individual habitat types. Some of them are going to span multiple habitat types. Um, but what I've done is I've layered these species uh, location data, and I've uh, layered that over the habitat types and the ecoregions. And that allows me to, for any where any location in California, to extract the local interaction network. So just an interaction network representing the species, plant and insect species, and the interactions that occur uh, right there where you live. All right. So when we look at the app, um, it's the first thing you're going to do is input your location and. The first thing it's going to tell you is which eco regions you occur in. These are from the EPA. Um, there's going to be a variety of options here. You can select your desired habitat type from the list. So these are, again, are just going to be the natural habitats that occur around you. And then you can filter the results um, in a variety of ways to show you just host plants, nectar plants, or both, and focusing on just butterflies, moths, or both. Um, and I see in the chat that some people are looking at uh, ha maybe having some issues with using the app. Um, hopefully by the end of this talk, you'll get a better idea of um, how to use it. Um, but with that being said, it is a work in progress. Sometimes it just doesn't quite work. And so um, maybe refresh the browser and try it again. Um, so after you put in all of this information, it's going to show you a list of your priority plant species. I'm going to explain how these priority plant species are arrived at. And then when you scroll down in the app, it's also going to show you a illustration of your local interaction network. So again, these are these uh, ecological interaction networks. On the left, we have our um, our nectar plants. And on the right here, we have the host plant interaction network. All right, so coming back to point number one, the importance of planting native hosts and nectar plants. So we see a lot of emphasis um, on things like pollinator gardens. And these are gardens planting those showy flowers that attract adult butterflies and bees and other pollinators. Um, on the other side of the spectrum, in the case of the monarch butterfly, for example, we have an emphasis on growing their host plants. So those plants that the larval stage uses. Um, but again, remember that Lepidoptera rely on native plant resources at each stage of their life cycle. So really just focusing on the two main resource use life stages, the um, caterpillar and the adult, we've there's been studies showing that resource use in these two life stages independently determine extinction risk in Lepidoptera species. Um, and really interestingly, the loss of monarch nectar plants could actually contribute more to their decline than the loss of milkweed. So most of the emphasis is on milkweed, but it turns out that there's some evidence suggesting that um, they're suffering more from the loss of those nectar plants that they visit as adults. And so really what this is telling us is that conservation efforts need to consider resource dependencies at each life stage, not just the caterpillar, not just the adult, but all of them together. Um, and again, with this data set, we have a really uh, amazing opportunity, uh, opportunity to do just that. Um, in analyzing this data, I found that number one, caterpillars are more specialized than adults. And so in our herbivory network, again, the network representing the interactions between host plants and caterpillars, there's an average of 3.6 interactions per Lepidopter species. Um, on the other hand, in the flower visitation network, we have an average of 14.7 nectar plants 
per species. So again, the caterpillar stage is much more specialized, relying on fewer plant species. Um, and this in part makes the caterpillar stage more sensitive to plant extinctions than the adult stage. Um, so it only using simulations, we found that it only takes an average of 1.4 plant extinctions to drive one insect extinct from the herbivory network. Whereas in the flower visitation network, it takes an average of 6.25 plant extinctions to drive one insect extinct. So again, the caterpillar stage is more sensitive and more specialized. Um, and you know what this is telling us is that caterpillars are picky eaters. They re often rely on very few native plant species. Um, and that means we have to be picky in choosing which host plants to provide them. We need to be providing specific host plants. Looking at this data in a slightly different way, we found, so here on the x-axis, we have the number of host plants. Um, and on the y-axis here, we have the percent of Lepidoptera that have that number of host plants. Uh, of host plant species. So I found that 43%, almost half of butterfly and moth species in California have just one host plant species and a full 73% have three or fewer. Um, and so that really this emphasizes the wow. importance of picking out those specific host plants. Um, I'm not really gonna, for the sake of time here, I'm already um, running very low on time. Um, but I'm not gonna go through this plot in detail, but we've also found that Lepidopter use discrete hosts and nectar plants. So they're using a different subset of plants as host plants in their communities than they are as nectar plants. And so really what this plot is showing those, uh, these distinct clusters of host plant communities in the blue and nectar plant communities um, in the orange across all of our California regions, uh, ecoregions and habitat types. All right, so for this first part here, we found that while the caterpillar stage is more specialized than the adults, and that potentially makes them more vulnerable to plant species loss, we have shown that Lepidopter use different hosts and nectar plants. And so while we have a lot of emphasis on either supporting one life stage or the other, we need to be supporting both um, the caterpillar and the adults. And that means planting those host plants and the nectar plants. And this is a sign from the UCR Botanic Gardens that's emphasizing that important point. Um, and part of this is a cultural shift. We need to accept herbivory as a good thing. And so we need to have herbivore gardens just like we have pollinator gardens. And the central idea here, one that I like to emphasize is that without the caterpillar, you don't get the butterfly or the moth and vice versa. Without supporting our adult butterfly and moth populations, we're not gonna get future generations of caterpillars. All right, coming to point number two here, I'm gonna try to go a bit quicker here, um, prioritizing the most important plant species. California is a super diverse state. We have 60, over 6,500 native or endemic plant species in the California floristic province. And of those, there are about 1,900 that are included in this data set as known Lepidoptera hosts and nectar plants. So this still leaves us with a tremendous diversity of plant species to choose from if our goal here is to best support butterflies and moths. And so we have to do some prioritizing here. And I want to begin this discussion of how we prioritize plant species with the unfortunate reality, which is that we are not going to be able to save all of our butterfly and moth species. Um, so again, remember, almost half of all butterfly species in the U.S. that have been assessed are declining, over 200 species, especially here in the Southwest. Um, you know, the monarch gets the most attention, but again, there are species that are even more at risk than the monarch butterfly, and the fact is that we're not going to be able to save all of them. And so, which species should we focus on providing resources for? This is a really important question, and a lot of conservation in the United States has focused on those rare declining or already endangered species like the monarch butterfly. So if we're talking about planting native plants here to support insects, you know, planting milkweed for the monarch butterfly. But there's growing recognition that perhaps we should be planting those plant species that support not one or two, but support the majority of Lepidoptera species in our ecosystem. So just planting those 
plant species that support as many species as, as possible. And a really great example of that in California, in addition to oak species that Doug Tallamy talks a lot about, are Ceanothus species, which support hundreds of butterflies and moths. And really, I want to emphasize that this question is not always black and white, and those two goals don't have to be mutually exclusive here. Um, and so the way that I prioritize species in this app is coming back to a concept in ecology called the keystone species concept. And keystone species are just those species that are disproportionately important to the rest of the system, like the keystone in a, in a Roman arch. And so what I found here is that few plant species support the majority of Lepidoptera species. And so what I'm going to show you are, here are these um, accumulation curves that are showing here on the x-axis the percent of plants um, that are supported by a, uh, that support a certain percent of Lepidoptera species on the y-axis. And I'm showing these curves for both our host plants in blue and our nectar plants in orange here. And so to get to 90% uh, of Lepidoptera supported. Um, on average, across our California ecoregions and habitats, it takes just, sorry, 32% of host plant species and just 9.3% of nectar plant species to support a full 90% of Lepidoptera species in our ecosystems. So again, these are the plants that are doing most of the work out here that are disproportionately important. These are our keystone species. But we can take this idea a step further with ecological networks and we can analyze what's called network modularity. And this is just the tendency of groups of species within networks to form compartments of more closely interacting species. So here we have, let's say this is our whole interaction network in a specific area. And these modules uh, are represented by these shaded regions. And within these modules, we have our module hubs, which are species that are highly connected within their own module. And we have our module connectors, which are species that help connect different modules and maintain that cohesion. Um, and these are really important species. Um, and importantly, the loss of these hubs and connectors um, has been shown to lead to cascading extinctions across these networks. So again, these are those keystone species that are disproportionately important to the stability of the rest of the, of the system. Um, and so we can perform this modularity analysis at both local and landscape scales. Um, I'm not going to go into the details of this, but basically we can look at it within individual habitats. And we can also look at how species help connect different habitats across entire landscapes. And so when you see this uh, list of priority plant species, this is showing you those species that were calculated from this modularity analysis to be disproportionately important to the stability of the rest of the system here. Um, and really importantly, this ranking method does not necessarily sacrifice our rare or threatened species. So I want to focus again on the monarch butterfly as an example of this. Um, milkweed is known as the monarch plant, but it turns out that milkweed species in the genus Asclepius in California hosts four other Lepidoptera species and provide nectar for 104 other Lepidoptera species as well. So the milkweeds are not just for the monarch, they're super important for a, a wide variety of um, Lepidoptera, but both butterflies and moths in California. All right, so concluding this part, we found that few keystone plant species support the majority of Lepidoptera species. And we found that this community level plant ranking system that I've developed here does not necessarily sacrifice our rare or threatened species like the monarch butterfly. All right, coming to my last point here, which I've already touched on a little bit, the importance of considering geographic variation. So I showed you how I use those, um, uh, our California ecoregions and habitats to extract those local interaction networks. And again, this is that modularity analysis, that keystone species analysis that I just shown you is going to be performed specifically at your location. So just using the insects and the plants that occur right near you. Um, and this is really important because we found that the identity of those top 10 plant species, so just the most important plant species in each, in each location, 
does vary significantly from location from one location to another. And so again, this is a complex plot that I'm not going to go into in detail here, but what this is showing, the separation between these points here represented by the colors. So each of these colors represents um, a group of the most important plant species in a specific ecoregion in California. And the separation between these here is showing that they are significantly different from one another. The identity of those species are significantly different from one ecoregion to another. We also found the same pattern um, at the habitat level. So when we look just at one ecoregion, for example, Southern California, which is where I am, we found that the identity of the most important plant species also varies between the habitat types within that ecoregion. All right, and this makes a lot of sense when we zoom in on how individual species importance varies across the landscape. So on the y-axis here, I'm just showing you a, a metric of plant importance, and this is on a scale of zero to one, and again, it's calculated from that network analysis that I showed you. And on the y-axis here, we have the California ecoregions roughly organized from north to south. Um, and so I'm just going to plot individual plants on this plot here. First, we have uh, Achillea millifolium, yarrow. Um, and what we're seeing here is that um, this plant species does vary significantly in how important it is for Lepidoptera throughout the landscape. So we see kind of a peak importance here in the central basin and range ecoregion in California. Um, and when we plot more plants on, on this graph here, this in this case, narrow leaf milkweed, we see that not only do these other plants kind of have a different pattern of where they're more important and where they're less important. So for example, narrow leaf milkweed appears to get more important in the Southern part of its range. Um, in terms of its importance for Lepidoptera. But we're also seeing that these plants differ from one another generally in how important they are. Um, and so again, chemise, we have a different pattern here. And finally, California mugwort. So um, again, this for the in the green here, we have Achillea millifolium, um, which is consistently in the higher range of this plant importance metric. Um, so it's it's Achillea millifolium yarrow is a really good butterfly and moth plant. California mugwort, maybe not so much. Um, you know, it's a great plant for other reasons, but it it's not doing a whole lot to support butterflies and moths. All right, so what we found in this last part here is that the identity of the top 10 plant species for Lepidoptera varies significantly between our California ecoregions and habitats. And we also saw that the importance of individual plant species for Lepidoptera also varies significantly throughout the landscape. And so what I wanna do in the future with this data is look at climate change predictions. And so these current networks that the app is gonna show you and show you your priority plant species. This is based on which plants are occurring right now in these locations. But one thing we know about climate change is that species ranges are gonna be shifting, often northward and often upward in elevation. So here in the red, maybe we have the projected um, distribution of these species. So we're gonna have a different future interaction network, a different future community between our the plants that are occurring there in the future and the butterfly and moths that are occurring there. Um, and what I want to do is couple this sort of network analysis with species distribution modeling in order to determine what those future communities are going to look like and perhaps which plant species are going to be the most important um, for maintaining stability as the climate changes. All right, so I began this talk with the depressing news that the Western monarch population suffered a catastrophic decline in 2020. But the good news of this story is that in part due to milkweed planting efforts, the Western monarch population rebounded over a hundredfold in 2021. Yay! Um, so yeah, great news. Um, so we had uh, over 200,000 individual monarchs counted compared to just under 2,000 in 2020. So, um, you know, a stunning recovery here, again, in part because of milkweed planting efforts. But I've hope, I hope I've shown you here today that it's not just the monarch butterfly that's at risk. 
Um, there are entire communities of butterflies and moths that are threatened by climate change and other factors. And so the butterfly net is designed to help us all start planting the best hosts and nectar plants to support these communities in California. All right, so that's the end of my talk. I did want to briefly mention that the butterfly net is a work in progress. Um, there are errors in this data. It's a tremendous amount of data. So if you use this app and you see, for example, a plant species that you know does not belong in your area, please report that error. You can email me directly in my emails posted up here, but you can also use the links that are provided on the website. And with that, I'd just like to thank everyone who's helped me so much on this project, including my PI, Nicole Rafferty, and the rest of our lab. Um, thank you so much to Jeffrey Caldwell. Um, this project would not be possible without um, you know, his diligent work and his care in curating this data set. Um, you know, thanks to CMPS and Calscape, uh, I've been working with them to integrate this into their online systems, including their native plant gardener uh, or their native plant garden planner. And um, of course, thank you to all of my undergraduates who've helped me. All right. So with that, I can take any questions. Sorry for going so much over time here. <laughs> No, you're good. Thank you so much, Chris. That was fantastic. Best presentation ever in a long time. Wonderful. Yes, very nice. Um, I have a few questions, um, but um, anybody else? Um, I hope I, it's okay if I start. start. <laughs> um, yeah, I was wondering, um, um, I had a couple of them here. So we see all the, the um, information about all the pesticides, neonicotinoids, and um, you know, glycophosphates, et cetera, are they um, just as deadly for moths or more? I mean, than butterflies and bees that we hear about? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, neonics yeah. are really bad across the board for pretty much any insect. Um, Matt Forrester, uh, who's a uh, faculty at the University of Nevada, Reno, has done some work on certain pesticides and how they affect butterflies. And yeah, absolutely, you know, neonicotinoids. There's a reason why there's so much effort right now from people that care to get them banned um, because, yeah, they, they're they really bad news. Um, you know, my opinion is that and at least in home yards and gardens, there's really no need to be using pretty much any pesticides. But the fact is that certain pesticides are worse than others, and agriculture needs to understand that. And so, you know, I, I really commend people who are working on those initiatives to get those those really bad uh, bad ones banned. I have two more questions, too. Um, one is, um, do moths have migration patterns like certain butterflies do, you know, and, or fly long distances? Um, and the second question is, um, how do they, how do moths even um, function having to fly at night without the warmth of the sun or anything to help them? Yeah, um, great questions. Uh, that first question, I really don't know, actually. Um, I know that there are like small scale migrations that occur, you know, some moths may spend certain part of the year at lower elevations um, and then move to higher elevations or vice versa. Um, I think the monarch butterfly is pretty unique um, in terms of Lepidoptera and its migration. We don't really, I don't think, know of many other butterflies that undergo such a drastic migration pattern. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll look more into that. That is an interesting question. Um, and then the second question about, yeah, how do moths function at night? Um, so a lot of moths can thermoregulate. Um, and so that's not all insects can thermoregulate, um, but the ones that can basically use their muscles and movement to warm up their bodies. And so one thing that some of you may be familiar with, if you've ever seen a moth that seems to be like shaking, it, vibrating its wings really quickly, um, you know, sometimes when they're, when they like 
hit a light and then are on the ground, they'll be doing that. Or you may see them on plants doing that. They're thermoregulating. They're warming up their flight muscles, warming up their body. And that allows them to function and fly uh, at low temperatures at nighttime. Hmm. Yeah, bats, bats do that sometimes when they go, when they're kind of half asleep. And then if you disturb them in the day, Yep. They do a real shivery thing to get going. Yeah. Huh. Yep. Thanks. Yeah. It's, I mean, humans do it too. That's, that's what shivering is. Um, but yeah, not, not all insects <laughs> can do that. Honeybees can do it. Uh, hawk moths can do it. Um, so it's, it's pretty cool to see though. Yeah. And there other questions, anybody? Okay. Oh, well, this is really fun. Yeah, thank you, Chris. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. And tell, every, tell, uh, tell, your, tell your colleagues about our Sierra Club uh, job opportunity as a director. Yeah, I'm, I am very interested in that. I'll, I'll pass the word along. Um, there's some recent grads maybe that might be interested in it. I'll see. Yeah. Yeah. So Pam, Karen okay, well, had a question in the chat. Ah, oh, I didn't see that. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, there's three new messages. Sorry. Let's take a look here. Okay. But Chris, I was wondering, okay, Karen, would would any of your staff be interested in going with me to this meeting tomorrow night to talk to the senator about? The 70%? Um, I mean, I'm sure people would be, but it, I feel like it may be a little bit short notice for most yeah, people. Yeah, very much, yes. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll, I would, I mean, as soon as you said that, I was like, dang, I wish I had known about that. Yeah, week ago. I know. No, I just I, heard about it a couple, couple hours ago. Yeah. No, I, I think, uh, you know, if, if there's an opportunity like that in the future, definitely reach out to me and I'll put the word out. But yeah, absolutely. Like we have, we have an entire program here at UCR called Science to Policy that oh. um, focuses on, you know, scientists getting out there and engaging with policymakers and stuff like that. So I think those sorts of opportunities are something that we're really interested in. Well, what I can do is uh, maybe just set up a meeting in the future. Um, yep. So I'm, you know, I'm, our side is better prepared, you might say. Awesome. Yeah. And then, yeah, really quick answer, yeah. your question in the chat about the common names. Yeah. Um, I, I currently have an undergraduate. So the common names, um, the, the issue in our data is that basically what we have to manually link each scientific name to the common name, yeah. um, which is something that I don't have time to do right now. Yeah. So yeah. I yeah. I just hired an undergraduate who I hope will be interested in helping with that. So oh, okay. probably in the next quarter, or so academic quarter, we'll we'll have the common names put on there. That that's definitely a priority. Okay, thank you. Yep. Yeah, it looks like Carrie mentioned that um, just what you're talking about. She she asked if you would uh, be working with Karen to get the state laws passed for you know mandatory native plants yeah, in uh, housing developments too. Yeah. yeah, let me know if there's anything I can do. Um, I'm definitely interested in helping with that. Yeah, if we I, I was told by yeah. Audubon if we. If we get it passed in California, the federal government might be interested in it, which would be yeah. huge, obviously huge. And so, yes, yeah, since you have, since you're already working on that, I'd love to bring you in. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I I would I would love. And to. I like that. Okay. I like that stat that you mentioned, um, Karen. Did you get that? Did you have that st statistic that he said um, native plant support fifteen times? as many um, Lepidoptera species as ornamentals. Is that kind of what you said, Chris? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So um, if you're familiar with Doug Tallamy, he oh, has yes. done a lot of research. 
on that yeah. kind of stuff. And yeah, several of his of his studies have shown just that that you know native plants support um, much more native butterfly and moth diversity um, than introduce invasive ornamental plants, um, which are unfortunately usually the ones that we use in in landscaping and gardening and stuff. Um, so yeah, I if you want uh, specific figures, I can I can send you that information. But I would also recommend yeah looking at Doug Tallamy's research. Yeah, great. Okay, well thanks again. This is your last chance, anybody? Otherwise, we're going to sign off. Okay. Great job, Chris. <laughs> bye bye, everybody. Thanks okay. again, Chris. Bye bye. Okay. Bye. bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. It's great.